Most of us think that a European medieval settlement or city is a perfect example of unsanitary conditions. There was no sewage or clean running water, and that's right, but people were constantly thinking about hygiene, as well as methods of taking charge of any ailments. They clearly understood that it was simply impossible without knowledge. But despite that, due to the lack of decent knowledge, which is, let's be clear, is possessed by a child today, medieval hygiene and medicine were somewhat different, and this will make many people's hair stand on end. So here will be a story about these spheres of life of an average medieval European person, which shock our contemporaries. The main thing here is to believe that everything that will be described below was invented for the convenience and value for a man. Often the only chance to survive was not a doctor, but a barber. This is flip side of history. Welcome. Today's topic is horrific details about hygiene of medieval medicine. We will continue our episode. Washing the body. Let's begin with the fact that not everyone could afford to wash every single day. It's good if you lived on a wide flowing river, but many villages on the mainland were located on such bodies of water that their inhabitants would stink less if they did not go there at all. And by the way, most of the clean waterways like bridges, wells and woods had their owners, and thus they had to be paid. That is why Russian history is so strikingly different from that of Western Europe. People had baths and literally free from ownership rivers, large rivers, and a lot of them. And the population density has always been lower than in Western Europe. It's true, villagers and forest dwellers often had little time to clean up each day. But what about the townspeople or the inhabitants of the castles on hills? Noble and rich people could force servants to get them water and heat it. They washed in huge tubs and sometimes in spacious stone baths. For women, maids could throw herbs or rose petals. Although, here's the intricate moment, and here we are already talking about medicine. Scientists of those times did not recommend abusing hot water, and even more so steaming hot baths, invented in antiquity. They said that because of such procedures, early obesity begins, as well as weakness of body. That is, the therapeutic effect of the relaxing treatments widely advertised today was pretty much considered the beginning of the end. The demented bather was seen by the priests as a gradually dying man or woman, and it was the representatives of the Western Christian Church who promoted the basics of science at that time. As a result, even a person of royal blood washed in hot water no more than once a week. More often, it was recommended to use liquid medicine. Water was perceived as such for sick and pregnant women, and how glad the city commoner was to have such a useful limit. It saved him from two essentially great aesthetics coasts and health so-called issues. In addition, it would take a long time to heat water for a tub. Some did not have a tub at all, others could not afford extra firewood, and the public baths were not free. The Russian princess Anna Yaroslavna, who became married to the French King Henry I in the middle of the 11th century, wrote to her father that her husband and all the court nobility will stink extremely bad. And by the way, medieval ladies used an egg as a gum to maintain lush hairstyles. Can you imagine how one's head stank a week later on the eve of the long-awaited washing? Or was it even long-awaited? We have to add that soap was already there. It was made of fat and ashes. Aromatics were astronomically expensive. Restroom Things City toilets, made of stone or wood, depending on the area, were not separate cabins, but sheds for several people at once. There were benches with holes around the perimeter. Human waste ended up in a special drain, from which it fell into the general cesspit of the entire town. Poor farmers took out everything that accumulated here at night, so as not to embarrass the townspeople or inhabitants of castles with the horrible smell. They were carrying this amount of fertilizers to their farms. Oh, and people wiped themselves with hay or herbage. A Damnation from God for All Women If in ancient times women were considered unclean because of their connection with the other world, then the doctors of the period under consideration here, and you have already understood that they are most often churchmen, were sure of one specific fact. Menstrual discharge is a curse from God, for Eve's sin in the Garden of Eden. Because of this, doctors did not have to give any medication to alleviate the woman's condition during the critical days. They strongly believed that the punishment for sin must be accepted as it is. 
In such a crucial situation, women begin to make anesthetics from plants, studying herbs, and secretly sharing recipes with each other. The top of the church clergy were always men. Therefore, they perceived witchcraft as a diabolical business. Any healer of this so-called curse could always be accused of witchcraft, and many of us know what was done to those who were called witches. Nuns, on the other hand, could be left without menstruation at all, since their life was associated with strict fasting and low-calorie food. As a result of this, their bodies could not afford to prepare for reproduction in full. That is why they were considered pure not only because of their virginity. Let's move on. How people of the time secured themselves from infections The urban population of Europe carried pokes in their noses during the casual walk through the streets. The fact is that sewage was poured out of the houses directly into the pavements. Even more so, butchers butchered the carcasses of animals and birds, leaving everything that was not bought exactly right at the spot. Obviously, dogs and crows dragged it all over the blocks. As an example to others, hanged criminals were left on the streets after the person died. The strong smell of spoiled clothes, decay and feces of various animals filled the air inside the city walls with such a stench that it was simply impossible to survive without the pouches, protecting the nasopharynx and consequently the lungs. The western kingdoms of those years were very alert that a lot of ailments began from just bad air. The worst things began, of course, during the heat. What was in the bags of average people? In the most common cases, rose petals. They had the strongest positive smell. Who cured illnesses in medieval times? So, in the Middle Ages, physicians, anyone who studied the human body, were divided into three categories. First, hairdressers, barbers, and bathhouse attendants. The doctors from the universities looked down on them. The people of the service industry had a minimum knowledge of treatises and important papers in this field. But they had an advantage. They were the ones who had the most practice, passed down from father to son through trial and error. First of all, they were dentists. And where there was no person with a diploma, there was also a surgeon. They cut out ooze and even cataracts from the eye. We can just guess how painful it was. Second, then were the pharmacists. Their knowledge concerned only the effect of substances on the body and the methods of their preparation. Third, and finally, there were essentially doctors. The latter, having a good command of the theory, often got into trouble in practice, since most of the scientific works on medicine of that time were written, again, by people related to church. They entrusted the healing of a person to God. When a patient died, it meant that either heaven or hell has taken them. Physicians, in the full sense of the word, only began to be separated as a fully independent group in the 14th century. In addition, a lot of real knowledge came to Europe only after the Crusades, in which the West got acquainted with the ways of treatment of the East, and it was much closer to modern medicine. How Syphilis Was Treated and Painkillers What was done to a person so that he would not suffer from pain? Not a problem. Something was inserted into the patient's mouth so that he would not bite his lips to the flesh, and then two strong assistants were asked to hold him just in case they were tied to the table with heavy ropes. The surgeon tried to pick something out or cut it off as quickly as possible. And those who hesitated to treat efficiently were called horsemen. Only at a fairly late stage was the patient given a decoction of poppy straw to drink. It is worth knowing that opiates, like the best anesthetics of antiquity, came again not from the Western culture but from the East. However, for those who could afford it, a potion made from alcohol with the right herbs was poured down their throats. The most popular out of all way to reduce suffering was turning to God. They prayed. Mouth ulcers were cauterized with a red hot iron. It's easy to understand their pain. They tried to hold out against gastric and venereal diseases by using potent substances, most often arsenic. Scientists find it in the bones of our ancestors. Surgeries of which kind and how they took place? The first thing to note here is that the instrument has not been sterilized, so the patient's correction was sort of a Russian roulette. Secondly, surgeons rarely washed their hands before and after surgery, leaving even less chance for the patient and even exposing themselves to contamination with microorganisms from the diseased body. 
and all of it due to the growing reality that before the plague of 14th century with it being the cause of death of over 25 million people, the population were quite lenient before the plague about the threat of infections. Which kinds of surgeries were present at the time? Any disorder in the mouth, on the skin and even on the eye was immediately removed. They simply did not know how to clean, treat or put a filling in the problematic zone. As you know, there was no anesthesia, as well as doctors. One in 10,000 people at best. Surgeries were performed by barbers, who were often also bathhouse servants. In passing, they could have amputated something. A person with a diploma was invited only for something truly serious, such as to make a hole in the skull, for nervous diseases and migraines, or a full-length trepanation. For more dangerous symptoms. Even the chest was also opened, although this was done to save a truly noble person, inviting a specialist of the highest level around and abroad. An ultimate cure – bloodletting. Lamentably, this curative remedy survived the Middle Ages and even partially modern times, disappearing in most countries only in the period of modern history. What is the secret of its acceptance during such a long time? It was the most common out of all ways. If something could not be treated, then they turned to this procedure. It was believed that the bad blood, the one with the disease, would go away on its own. But the problem was that they did not pour any blood in return. After a large number of such procedures, the patient was far closer to death than to staying alive. As an epilogue, it is worth pointing out that medieval man had such a strong desire to save people from ailments that at that time brilliant people were passionate about medicine. Progressive monks, various writers, artists, they were also sculptors, architects, inventors and alike. You are watching Flip Side of History. We hope you enjoyed this episode and you got to know something new today. Do not hesitate to leave a like and subscribe to this channel. And we we'll see you later.